Sergeants, if you can begin your recording, please. We see recording rolling. Cloud started. Backup is rolling. Excellent. Thank you much. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council he Committee hearing uh, of general welfare. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that email address is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you very much for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning, everybody. Here, I'll, I'll gavel in. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this hearing of the City Council's Committee on General Welfare. As you may have seen, some of the Council's committees have been reorganized, and issues related to juvenile justice are now within the purview of the General Welfare Committee. Today, the committee will hold an oversight hearing on the juvenile justice system during the COVID-19 pandemic. The committee will examine the status of, ju of the juvenile justice system during the COVID-19 pandemic, including the impact the pandemic has had on youth insecure, limited secure, and non-secure juvenile detention facilities. In addition, the he hearing will cover the impact of physical court closures on the juvenile justice system and plans for expanding the capacity of virtual courts to ensure that gridlock and delay do not overwhelm the city's courts. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic in the spring of 2020, the city agencies took the step to modify their programs and services to be in compliance with public health guidance and the best practices in mitigating the spread of the virus. In May of 2020, ACS related a revi released a revised plan for the providers related to modifying, to modifying staffing and training requirements in congregate settings. In addition to the health and safety concerns for youth and staff in congregate settings, there's also much concern about but about, excuse me. About adequate pardon me, sorry. Obviously doing two things at once here. Um, Uh, I'll just go back. ACS re revised plan for their providers related to modifying staffing and training requirements in congregate settings. In addition to the health and safety concerns for youth and staff in congregate settings, there's also much concern about adequate access to remote learning for youth in these detention settings. As reported by the city, uh, the, the news outlet, ACS and DOE are working to expand access through secure voice communications for remote learning, as well as, ex uh, as expanding tutoring services. And there, have been, there has been no timeline for implementing these changes, however. ACS and their not-for-profit providers have also taken steps to ensure that there was some movement forward in cases where possible, where, where possible despite the court closures and slowdowns due to the crisis. According to a report released by the New School Center for Urban Affairs, the agency has been able to use discretion to extend visitation in instances where family were close to reunification. However, the long delays due to family court closures and the lack of clarity on when in-person operations will be able to resume have left youth, family, and service providers in limbo. I wanna thank all the advocates, members of the public, and those with lived experience who are joining us today. Uh, joining us remotely today. Thank you for uh, representatives from the administration for joining us and I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. I'd like to thank my staff, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, um, Elizabeth Adams, my legislative director, Nicole Hunt, um, uh, my interim legislative director and committee staff, Aminta Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omari, policy analyst and Dan Krupp, finance analyst. Um, I want to also acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Brad Lander and Council Member Mark Traeger. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Council 
the committee. Thank you, Chair Levin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel to the Committee on General Welfare at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a delay of a few seconds before you are unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call individuals up in panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and then give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. For, today, for today's testimony, the first panel will include representatives from the Administration for Children's Services, followed by council member questions and then public testimony. In order of speaking, we will have David Hansel, Commissioner of ACS, and for questions and answers, Sarah Hemeter, Acting Deputy Commissioner, Angel Mendoza, Chief Medical Officer, Charles Parkins, Deputy Associate Commissioner, and Lewis Watts, Senior Assistant Commissioner. I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Hansel. It appears that Commissioner Hansel is labeled as Stephanie Gendel. Flagging that for our staff. Yes, my apologies. We're having some technical audio difficulties here. Um, can you see me on the yes. video? Okay. Yes, I, I do. I think you're clear to hear as well. So you're Thank, you. Thank you, Commissioner. Deputy Commissioner Hemeter. I do. Chief Medical Officer Mendoza. I don't see the Chief Medical Officer here anymore. So I will call up the next folks for, for the oath, Deputy Associate Commissioner Parkins. Deputy Associate Commissioner Parkins needs to be unmuted. Okay, you are unmuted. Thank you. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you so much. And finally, Senior Assistant Commissioner Watts. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Hansel, you may begin. Can you hear me? Good, thank you. Uh, apologies for the technology problems. Um, good morning, Chair Levin, members of the General Welfare Committee. I'm David Hansel. I'm commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Um, with me today, as you've just heard from ACS, are Sarah Hemeter, who is our acting deputy commissioner for our Division of Youth and Family Justice. Dr. Angel Mendoza, who is also having some technical problems, but hopefully will be on in time for the Q&A. Uh, and Dr. Mendoza is our chief medical officer. Um, also with us are Charles Parkins, who is our Deputy Associate Commissioner, and Lewis Watts, our Senior Assistant Commissioner in DYFJ. Um, we very much appreciate the fact that uh, this committee has exercised oversight uh, for, for many years of our child welfare and early childhood education programs, and we're delighted that the committee now has jurisdiction over our Juvenile Justice Division. As you'll hear, we worked very hard to weave the principles the programs and the services of child welfare into our youth justice work so that we can empower youth with the tools that they need to turn their lives around. We're grateful for the opportunity to testify before this committee about ACS's juvenile justice system and how we've responded to the unprecedented COVID-19 health crisis. New York City's juvenile justice system safely serves youth through a trauma-informed lens in the community wherever possible 
and with appropriate structure and supports in place. DYFJ oversees services and programs for youth at every stage in the juvenile justice continuum. And that continuum includes our community-based services for youth who are at risk of delinquency, as well as for their families. We also provide secure detention services and non-secure detention for youth who've been arrested and whom the court has ordered to be detained while awaiting resolution of their cases. This past decade has seen two major progressive reforms in juvenile justice in New York City and state. Since 2012, with the enactment of Close to Home, New York City juvenile delinquents who are adjudicated by the court to have committed offenses are no longer placed in Office of Children and Family Services facilities far from their homes, but instead are placed with ACS in small home-like settings in or very near the city where we provide therapeutic services to those youth and their families while their young people are in, medical, are in residential care and upon their return to the community. Second and long overdue, as of October 1st of last year, New York State has finally caught up to the rest of the country as the two-year process to raise the age of criminal responsibility from age 16 to age 18 has been completed. Today, all newly arrested 16 and 17 year olds are now treated as juveniles in the justice system. In New York City, no 16 or 17 year old has been held at Rikers Island since October, 2018. If they are ordered to be detained, they are now detained at one of ACS's juvenile detention programs. We've made significant strides to improve the lives of children and families involved in the juvenile justice system with a special focus on keeping young people strongly connected to their families and their communities. And by pairing youth and families with the individualized supports that they need to help them succeed. Through our collaboration with numerous city partners, including NYPD, the Department of Probation, the Department of Education, the Department of Youth and Community Development, and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, as well as the City Council, advocates and providers, we've improved the prospects of justice-involved youth while enhancing public safety outcomes that affect all New Yorkers. Despite the many challenges that COVID-19 has presented, we've worked very closely with our provider community to adapt our entire continuum of juvenile justice programs to meet the needs of youth and their families while conforming to the public health demands of this unique time. Our community-based alternative programs continue to offer prevention and diversion services to safely keep youth out of the justice system and supported in their homes and with their families. Our detention system has taken extraordinary measures to keep both children and staff safe while providing the programming and supports that youth need to thrive. And our close to home program of residential placement and aftercare has effectively adopted public health protocols and is continuing to serve adjudicated youth, helping them safely transition back to the community. Protecting the health and safety of youth and staff in our detention and close to home programs has remained our top priority throughout the pandemic. As we'll discuss in more detail in the testimony, we've closely followed evolving public health guidance by implementing new protocols and procedures to protect the health and safety of the youth in our care and the dedicated staff who work with them each and every day. I'd now like to provide an overview of our juvenile justice continuum, beginning with our programs to keep youth out of the justice system through diversion and community-based programs, through our detention programs for youth awaiting adjudication of their cases, and ending with our close to home program for youth who have been ordered into placement by the court. Our goal is always to keep young people out of the juvenile justice system when that is safely possible through community-based services. We know that the best way to intervene positively in the lives of young people is to engage with the whole family. In New York City, our Family Assessment Program, or FAP, is a diversion program that's available to families of youth up to age 18 to help avoid involvement in the, just, the juvenile justice or the child welfare systems by providing therapeutic services grounded in a child welfare framework. 
Our services support families to address difficult teenage behaviors, such as sk skipping school, using drugs, running away from home, and or struggling with mental illness. To minimize court involvement, families in New York City must first participate in FAP services before filing a person in needs of supervision or a PINS petition in court. We also administer the Juvenile Justice Initiative, JJI, which serves youth adjudicated as juvenile delinquents who are under probation supervision as an alternative to placement. Specifically, JJI provides intensive services to youth in their communities rather than through placement in a custodial setting. JJI helps parents develop skills to support their children, enforce limits, and steer them towards positive peers and activities. FAP and JJI use home-based interventions, drawing on skilled clinicians to work closely with parents and youth in their homes and communities, while also engaging schools, after-school programs, and other professionals to support the family. These services range from community-based supports, such as mediation, respite, and mentoring programs, to ACS-funded intensive therapeutic evidence-based models, such as multisystemic therapy and functional family therapy. While these services are typically accessed through the courthouses and are delivered in families' homes, we have been able to maintain access to these programs in the pandemic, both virtually and in person. Now, while there are many off-ramps in place, including the programs that I've just described, as well as diversion and alternative to detention programs administered by the Department of Probation and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, judges in both family court and the Supreme Court's youth part may order a youth detained while awaiting trial. When this happens, youth go to one of our seven contracted non-secure detention sites or to one of our two directly operated secure detention sites. Crossroads Juvenile Center in Brooklyn or Horizons Juvenile Center in the Bronx. At the beginning of the pandemic, in light of emerging, thing, emerging health concerns, we undertook a review to identify those youth who could be safely returned to the community. While ACS does not have the authority to release youth from detention, through a collaboration with our sister agencies, we were able to support the release of over one third of the youth in detention, 20 from secure detention, 26 from non-secure detention. Today, currently, there are 32 youth at Horizon, 74 youth at Crossroads, and 18 youth in non-secure detention. All of these youth have been ordered detained by either a family court judge for juvenile delinquents or a judge in the youth part of the Supreme Court for juvenile offenders and adolescent offenders. By law, a youth charged as a juvenile delinquent or a JD is a young person who's accused of committing a crime, uh, an act that would be a crime if committed by an adult. Juvenile delinquent cases are heard in the family court and they now include youth ages 16 and 17 charged with misdemeanors, as well as felony cases transferred from the youth part in Supreme Court to the family court. A juvenile offender or JO is a youth who is alleged to have committed a higher level felony, such as murder or rape, when he or she was 13 to 15 years old. And pursuant to the Raise the Age Law, 16 and 17 year olds who are charged with felonies are categorized as adolescent offenders or AOs. JDs have their cases heard in family court, JOs and AOs have their cases heard in the youth part in Supreme Court. But those youth part judges can transfer some AOs to family court, except in situations where there are exceptional circumstances or if the felony was violent and caused substantial injury or death. The overwhelming majority of youth in secure detention today have been charged with higher level crimes. Currently, there are 71 AOs, 28 JOs, and seven JDs in secure detention. Only JDs can be detained in non-secure detention, and currently there are 17 JDs in non-secure detention. Um, we contract with five nonprofit providers to provide non-secure detention, NSD, which offers a less restrictive setting for lower-risk juvenile delinquents with court cases pending in family court. 
these NSD group homes house up to 12 youth and offer a supportive home-like environment and very close supervision of young people. To prepare for the implementation of Raise the Age and to ensure proper staffing at both Crossroads and Horizon, we created a new job and title of Youth Development Specialist or YDS. The YDS title represents an updated approach to juvenile justice that stresses the importance of establishing credibility with youth, connecting with them, and effectively de-escalating situations when necessary. We worked very hard to recruit YDS from across the city by doing extensive outreach in the neighborhoods and communities where our youth and families live to find qualified people committed to working with youth. All new YDS undergo an intensive six week training program that includes two weeks on the job training at one of the facilities. Our James Satterwhite Training Academy provides pre-service training on important topics such as understanding youth development and relationships, safety, security, and supervision, behavior modification and management, and group facilitation. All of our YDS have re received training in trauma-based approaches to working with teens and on the de-escalation of conflict and anger. Their skills are reinforced through intensive safe crisis management training with a focus on verbal de-escalation techniques as much as possible, physical constraint and restraint only where necessary. We also offer core supervisory training to all of our middle level managers and supervisors in secure detention to provide them with the skills they need to properly manage and coach staff and create a safe, stable environment for everyone. While the Department of Correction was initially required to assist ACS in staffing Horizon, because uh, in the early days of Raise the Age, it still housed so-called pre-Raise the Age youth, those who were still legally adjudicated as adults. But ACS assumed full operational control of Horizon in January, 2020. For the last three years, we've been aggressively recruiting, hiring, and training multiple classes of YDS. Like all city hiring, our hiring of YDS was impacted by the citywide hiring freeze at the beginning of the pandemic. However, since August 2020, we've been onboarding new classes every month, the most recent of which started last week. These new classes will help us increase the available staff in our detention facilities. Maintaining the health and safety of the youth and staff in our ACS operated secure detention programs is indeed our top priority. For youth in secure detention and for the dedicated staff who work with them every day, we've implemented strict protocols to minimize the health risk to staff and youth. Under the leadership of our chief medical officer, Dr. Mendoza, we've continued to follow the guidance of public health officials, including our own Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, our health and hospital system, and the Centers for Disease Control. As public health guidance has evolved through the course of the pandemic, we've adopted and implemented new protocols as needed, and we will continue to do so. We continue to disseminate up-to-date guidance to staff and youth about virus prevention practices, such as hand washing and social distancing. Our detention facilities are regularly and thoroughly cleaned and sanitized, and we've increased the number of cleaning personnel. We've equipped facilities with ample hand sanitizer, soap, gloves, and PPE for staff working with symptomatic youth. Nurses conduct temperature checks of all staff and visitors who enter the facility on each shift. And our health partners conduct daily screenings of staff. And all staff and youth are provided face coverings to help ensure the transmission is minimized. We have a full array of medical and mental health care on site serving the youth at Crossroads and Horizon. And to do that, we contract with the floating hospital to provide health services and Bellevue to provide mental health services. We've been working closely with Health and Hospitals Bellevue Hospital Center to provide trauma-informed screening and mental health services to young people, both in secure detention and in our non-secure detention continuum. Through its team of psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and mental health clinicians, Bellevue works very closely with our YDS, our case managers, our program counselors, and our contracted medical services staff to provide comprehensive care for all youth. 
We're very grateful to the hardworking teams who've been meeting the complex needs of our youth, both prior to and throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Education and programming are critical components within any detention facility, and these are key services that had to be quickly modified and adapted due to COVID-19. Youth in detention participate in remote learning provided by the Department of Education's Passages Academy using DOE issued Chromebooks. Like all public school students in New York City, remote learning during the pandemic has created some challenges. DOE teachers, in addition to RACS staff, have worked tirelessly to make the remote learning experience as positive and educationally rich as possible. We believe that programming is essential to enhance the therapeutic environment in detention while helping youth build self-esteem, helping them take part in positive activities, reduce idle time, connect with role models and credible messengers, and develop the skills that will redirect their lives in a positive direction. We've implemented new types of virtual programming to engage youth while adhering to social distancing protocols. For example, youth have access to video games, movies, and books on our ACS tablets. They're participating in virtual programming with various partners. These include a writing challenge through the KITE program, yoga, individual exercise challenges, and many more. And building on a very successful summer internship program, um, we're delighted that the Robin Hood Foundation is funding a fall enrichment program in which 78 youth in detention are receiving stipends to participate in programs such as Barista Cafe to learn uh, barista skills, book club, newsletter, and also training by credible, credible messengers for youth to be junior violence interrupters. Strong family engagement is another essential part of our model of care, and we've adapted it to make sure that youth remain connected to families. Our case management staff connect with families by phone at intake. They call parents to provide weekly progress updates on all youth. One of our early and most difficult decisions during this crisis was to suspend in-person visiting due to health risks. And then once again, we had to suspend in-person visiting this fall when virus levels increased in New York City. We'll continue to review this policy as the public health situation warrants. In the meantime, youth remain connected with their families through video visits and phone calls. To enable youth to both continue video visits with families and to appear by video at court hearings, we created secure and private booths at both of these facilities. We're in the process now of upgrading the Wi-Fi and procuring new tablets to make these video visits and court appearances more seamless. Since the start of the pandemic, we've arranged for about 3,500 video visits and approximately 2,500 video court appearances for youth in detention. As has always been the case, youth have access to free phone calls, they can write and send unlimited letters to parents and family members, and they can make unlimited calls to their attorneys. Especially during these trying times, we believe it's crucial to provide structure for youth and maintain our youth-focused model of care. And as discussed, youth in detention continue to receive high-quality medical and mental health care, access to education and programming, and maintain connections with their families. Now let me finally move on to close to home. In 2012, New York State and New York City partnered to create this program, which is now our juvenile placement system in which adjudicated juvenile detention uh, delinquents are placed in residential programs near their homes, their schools, and their communities. Our close to home non-secure and limited secure placement residences are located at 28 sites throughout the city and in Dobbs Ferry. These are run by seven nonprofit provider agencies. Close to Home is grounded in a child welfare framework and all of our providers are deeply experienced in serving the complex needs of youth in our care. Despite raising the age of criminal responsibility, ACS has actually seen a decline in the Close to Home census. In the last five years, we've seen admissions to Close to Home decrease by 54%. 
prior to close to home, there were 540 New York City youth placed in upstate juvenile placement settings run by the state. In 2018, by comparison, there were 110 youth placed in close to home. Currently, there are 72 youth in close to home placement and 34 who are on aftercare. All of our close to home programs offer structured residential care for youth in a small, supervised, and home-like environment. In contrast to the traditional larger juvenile placement facility model, close to home programs have been intentionally designed to enhance participation in programming while preserving the safety and security of youth, staff, and the community. Close to home allows for engagement to occur simultaneously with the youth, the family, and the community to ensure that the factors leading to juvenile justice system involvement are addressed before the youth returns to the community. In partnership with the Department of Probation, we've adopted a risk need responsivity or RNR framework and an evidence-based assessment tool, the Youth Level of Services or YLS to guide our intervention and ensure that we reduce the youth's likelihood to recidivate. Every close to home program is required to implement an evidence-based therapeutic model that serves as the primary mechanism of behavioral support. Through the chosen pro program framework, youth address their interpersonal relationships, their communication skills, and their emotional regulation. Close to home allows youth to be placed close to their families and home communities, which has made it easier to include the youth family at every level of intervention. The pandemic has made integrating families more challenging and on-site family visits are now limited due to rates of COVID positivity. Much like our residential foster care programs, however, close to home providers have integrated virtual visits to maintain the family connection. Youth and families have been equipped with all necessary devices to make virtual visitation possible. Youth and close to home participate in DOE's Passages Academy. Before the pandemic, uh, those youth in non-secure placement attended either Belmont or Bronx Hope. Youth in limited secure placement attended school on site. Now, um, like many of their peers, they are participating in remote learning. DOE and ACS's providers have ensured that all youth have DOE Chromebooks and that all are provided with additional assistance as needed. At the start of the pandemic, we created four isolation sites for both youth in foster care and youth in close to home who might've been exposed to COVID-19 or tested positive for COVID-19. These isolation sites include 24 hour nursing services and allowed us and our providers to quickly and safely quarantine youth who might be able to spread the virus from other youth. Currently, we have two isolation sites available to serve youth in foster care or close to home. One is in the Bronx, one is in Staten Island. Youth who are returning to the community receive aftercare supervision from their close to home provider. The goal of close to home aftercare is to build on the skills youth acquired while in placement and to help develop a network of support that will allow them to succeed in the community as they return. While in placement, youth form positive, trusting relationships with caring adults. These relationships are critical to facilitate each youth's growth, skill investment, skill development, and progress as they learn new ways of thinking and changing their behaviors. Residential providers build on these relationships with youth during aftercare, also leveraging broader agency resources and relationships that they may have with community-based organizations to supervise youth in the community with support from ACS to make sure that every youth's needs are being met. Now, given that it is New York state budget season, I do wanna take a moment to remind you that the state has cut back its support for the most vulnerable children and youth in New York City and for the youth in our juvenile justice continuum in particular. And the most recent, recently proposed state executive budget adds additional cuts. When state legislation created Close to Home in 2012, the state committed funding up to $40 million to support New York City's program. However, beginning in the state's 2018-2019 budget, 
the state eliminated all, all of the funding for close to home and continues to provide zero dollars for care of these youth. In addition, despite implementing the raise the age legislation, and when it did that, the state committed, it would pay for uh, close to home, I'm sorry, raise the age um, uh, expenses, and it appropriated $250 million for that purpose. However, New York City continues to receive zero dollars in support for raise the age because the statute only provides funding to counties that remain below a 2% property tax cap and that effectively excludes New York City. The current proposed legislation would add to these cuts. The state budget proposes to cut the state's reimbursement rate for detention by 5%. That would be a $2 million annualized cut to New York City. Also, the state budget proposes to cut the reimbursement rate for prevention services, including the FAP and JJI programs to a 59% state share, despite the statutory state share of 65%. That would result in a cut of over $25 million to ACS's full prevention services system. Um, we hope that you will join with us uh, you, in the city council to fight these cuts because they will negatively impact children and families in New York City. Let me say a word about vaccines. Um, it's now been, of course, almost a year that we have been managing our juvenile justice system in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been able to provide for the health, safety, security, education, and programming needs of our youth, the youth in our care. But we certainly look forward to the day when our youth can attend school in person, can see their families in person, can have their cases move more swiftly to the court process, and can even eat their meals without having to be socially distanced. The availability of COVID-19 vaccines now seems to be a light at the end of this very, very long tunnel. We strongly believe that the COVID-19 vaccines are a game changer for the health and safety of our youth, our provider staff, um, and our staff. As soon as vaccines became available to New Yorkers, we advocated to the state and the city for the staff in our congregate care facilities, including detention, non-secure detention, and close to home, to be prioritized for vaccination. And we were very happy when these staff were added to priority 1B in early January. We are now advocating that youth in our congregate facilities who are 16 years and older also be prioritized. In addition, we're working closely with the Vaccine Command Center, our chief medical officer and our floating hospital providers to provide vaccines for youth in our care who are 16 and over and have comorbidities who are eligible as of this week where there is proper consent for vaccination. We certainly understand the history of medical racism in this country and thus the hesitancy about vaccines among many of our staff and New Yorkers at large. We're working with our chief medical officer, with our unions and our other medical staff in our facilities to educate staff about the vaccines so that they can make informed decisions about getting vaccinated. In conclusion, I wanna thank all of our staff who are working in detention and close to home for their efforts to provide a safe, supportive, caring and programmatically engaging environment for youth during this incredibly challenging time. I know this has meant staff going to work to care for youth while fearing for the health and safety of themselves and their families. Their dedication and their commitment to the youth in our care has not gone unnoticed. And I want to be sure to use this opportunity to thank all of our incredible juvenile justice staff for their efforts throughout the pandemic. And finally, I wanna thank the General Welfare Committee for holding this hearing and for your interest in learning more about the programs and services in our juvenile justice continuum, particular, particularly during the pandemic. Thank you very much. And we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Commissioner Hansel. Before I turn over to Chair Levin for questions, I also realize that we have been joined by Chief Medical Officer Angel Mendoza, who had technical difficulties while we were, while we were administering the oath. So I'll do that now so that we don't have any issues during the Q&A and have to re-administer then. Um, so Chief Medical Officer Mendoza, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. 
And now I'd like to remind council members that as we are going through the Q&A session, please use the Zoom raise hand function to indicate whether you have a question for this panel in the administration. Please remember that you're keeping your questions and answers to five minutes. And now I'm going to turn it over to Chair Levin. Thank you very much, Committee Council of Kilowan. Uh, I wanna acknowledge before I ask questions that we've been joined by council members Dharma Diaz, Barry Gradenchik, um, Rafael Salamanca. Um, I had mentioned council members Lander and Traeger before. Um, and I will identify additional council members as they join us. Um, so I, I want to just ask, just because um, going through the testimony, um, I, you spoke of commissioner about um, uh, youth in detention uh, uh, prior to being adjudicated and after being adjudicated. So I just wanna make sure that we're having, um, so we're, we're clear exactly how many um, youth are in detention right now across the non-secure, limited secure and secure placements overall. So um, the, um, how many youth are in detention in, in secure placement right now, both pre-adjudication and post-adjudication? Uh, thanks for the question. So let me say, as you know, I have uh, with me today are really outstanding, outstanding members of our DYFJ leadership team. Uh, while I had the opportunity to deliver testimony, I will answer questions, but I want to make sure they have an opportunity to participate. So I will uh, actually turn your question first to uh, Deputy Commissioner Hemeter and to her team. Great. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and thank you uh, for inviting us to this hearing today to explain what is going on in juvenile justice during this time. So um, to, be, to, to answer your question, um, Pre-adjudicated youth are held in non-secure detention or secure detention. Um, and then post-adjudicated youth are held in our close to home placements for the most part. Um, in, in secure detention today, um, and uh, Chuck Parkins will jump in if I get the numbers wrong, they fluctuate quite, uh, quite a bit. Um, but today in secure detention, I believe we have a total in, that includes Crossroads and Horizon, 106 youth. 74 at uh, Crossroads and 30, what does that make, 32, 34, 32 at um, Horizon, and 17 youth in our non-secure detention facilities. Um, in close to home, the number of, that's post-adjudicated youth, we have 74 youth in placement and 34 youth who are on aftercare from their close to home placements. So they are at home with their families receiving supportive services, but still under um, supervision by the close to home program. And in and, and for the those youth in close to home, um, the 74 that are in placement right now, are they all in which which placements are they in? Um, the, those are the close to home placements. Um, we have 28 different sites. Okay, uh, so they're spread across those different sites. So none of them are in 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 Crossroads or Horizon. Correct. Okay. Um, so then, so if we have 70, now how does the, um, as that number has decreased, uh, Commissioner Hansel said by 54% over five years, um, there are 28 providers. Does every provider have a placement? I mean, I imagine for, for 74 um, youth in, um, you know, in, in placement right now out of in 28 facilities, that's, that's obviously very lo uh, low average. Right. So there's seven different providers with 28 different sites. Um, they, the census is very low right now. Um, part of that is a result of the pandemic and the, the court process uh, being slowed down. Um, so, so it is very low right now. We have, um, have, have a very low census right now. So yes, that is correct. Um, and so to speak a little bit about, if you wouldn't mind the, um, the, the relationship with um, uh, OCA or, or however, um, uh, how, how does the, how do the, 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 um, the youth courts, how do they, are they, they within the, they're within the jurisdiction of OCA, correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, and um, for, are we seeing a lot of, 
I mean, how, how is this all kind of working right now as a system? How has that changed due to COVID? How many, um, how many hearings are they having compared to prior to the pandemic? And, um, and how, is that, how is that changing? Um, or how, I'm, trying, I'm trying to um, think of a way to say this. That, um, how, are, how are we seeing the impact on communities? Are, 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 are youth not getting the services they need? Are, they, are cases not getting adjudicated? Um, right. Are they, uh, yeah. yeah. Kind of I'm not sure I can speak directly to OCA and, and their procedures. I mean, we have definitely seen a, a slowdown of the court process. Um, and that is, you know, based on executive orders um, and other things. So we have definitely seen a slowdown um, of that happening. Um, Young people who are in detention, are, for the most part, are the pre-adjudicated youth, um, and so their cases, they are with us while they are while their cases are pending. Um, we and the post-adjudicated case kids are with close to home, so those cases have gone through the court system. Mm -hmm. uh, they have reached disposition and are placed with with us. The only youth who are in close to home are the juvenile delinquents. So those are the kids who are going through the family court system. Um, the, the AOs and the JOs, which make up the bulk of our detention facilities, are going through the Supreme Court youth parts. Um, we have, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, we have um, tra transformed our detention facilities um, so that there are virtual court appearances happening, or we are making youth available for virtual court, uh, court hearings as well. So if the court is, was to schedule a court appearance, we do have the capability to um, produce that young person in front of a computer um, so that they can appear, appear for their court, court hearings. Um, as the commissioner mentioned in his testi testimony, we've created booths for them so that there is privacy um, we've increased our bandwidth so that, that all the virtual um, things that are happening in detention have, have the ability to go forward, um, but we are producing the young people when the court requires, uh, re requires us to do so. Um, is there an impact because of the slowdown in the, in, in the court administration um, that youth that are placed in detention um, are having their pre-trial or pre-adjudication detention extended because of that. And so are they basically being held in detention for a longer period of time than they otherwise would have, um, you know, in, in, secure, in secure placement? Is that, a, is that a concern that they're basically being held prior to adjudication for a longer period of time than they otherwise would have been? So, um... That is a concern. Uh, we have seen our length of stay, the length of stay of young people in detention um, increase um, during, during the pandemic. So yes, that is a concern for us. Do you us. have data on that? How long, what is the average length of stay? I do. Um, I imagine that's part of, that's in the MMR in your I believe, reporting. I believe that is, yes. Yeah. But I can, I can, let me, I can get that. Well, Deputy Commissioner Hemeter is looking, I might just add a couple things just for clarity. One is, uh, and this may be apparent, but just to say uh, for sure, ACS, when, you, when a, a case has, a, a, a youth has a case in court, ACS is actually not a party to that case. Our role is okay. just to provide custody for the youth while the case is moving. So we don't have really any ability to influence that process. Yes. Um, and Deputy Commissioner Hemeter referred to executive orders. What she was referring to is the fact that the governor uh, throughout COVID has issued a whole series of executive orders, which among other things, have waived speedy trial act requirements. So the time limits that normally require, that normally apply to cases in court have been waived under the governor's executive orders. So that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. why uh, the cases of youth in our care have not moved as quickly as they would normally do. Right, I, I, you're right. I, I don't mean this in a pejorative way towards ACS, but it, my concern is that youth are languishing in, a, in ACS custody um, uh, you know, for extended periods of time because of exactly what you just said, which is a waiving of the speedy trial uh, requirements. By yeah, I think we completely agree, Council Member. We, we want youth to be in attention for as short a period of time as possible and get their cases adjudicated as quickly as possible. So we're mm -hmm. in complete agreement with you. 
So, so in terms of the, the data, um, in July 2020, the juvenile offenders, which are the 13, 14, and 15-year-olds who are charged with serious crimes, the average length of stay is 97 days. Um, the juvenile delinquents are 14 days, um, so they, they do not stay with us as long as the other um, populations. And for adolescent offenders, which is the new category that go through the youth part, the average length of stay is 54 days. That's, um, and, and sorry, and that was when? What, July, what point in time? July 2020. Okay, now can you compare that to July 2019? I think we'd have to get back to you. I don't have that sure. data right on hand, yeah, no, but no, we can get back to you on that data for okay. sure. Um, um, I'll just ask a couple more questions and I'll turn it over to my colleagues. We've also been joined by Councilmember Gibson, by the way. Um, so thank you for joining us, Councilmember Gibson. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about um, uh, the range of um, diversion programs or alternatives to incarceration or inter alternatives to detention. Um, um, I know I could speak for example, I've uh, met um, a handful of times with Exalt Youth, uh, which is a um, fantastic program. And I was really blown away. I mean, I sat with them for, for several hours on a Friday afternoon um, with, a kind of, with a cohort of their, of their youth and was very inspired to see how dedicated um, they were to, to that model and to each other. And so um, uh, can you speak a, bit, a little bit about just how a program like Exalt fits into this um, uh, fits into the system and how are we um, developing and prioritizing programs like that? Right, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, we also work with Exalt. Um, and so that is a program that we are familiar with. Um, I think we're, we're always on the lookout for, for programming and other opportunities for young people in both detention and close to home uh, to connect kids um, to programs in their communities that, that um, understand, understand what, what they've been going through um, and can, can mentor, mentor them um, to get on the path to success. Um, so we, we, have, um, uh, we do have that partnership with Exalt um, and we also have lots of other um, credible messenger programs. Uh, so we work with Man Up um, and other programs uh, that, that are, are working with young people, um, both in detention and in close to home. Um, we, there's, a, there's a whole array of different programs um, and, and things that, that we can um, talk to you about. L Lewis might uh, be able to speak to some of those um, that we have in detention specifically. Great. Um, Assistant Commissioner, you have to unmute yourself. Just to our staff, our a senior assistant commissioner Watts needs to be unmuted. Okay. Okay, here we go. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Great, great. Good morning, Chair. Uh, good, good morning, morning council members. Good morning, committee. So as uh, Deputy uh, Associate Commissioner Hammond was stating, there's an array of programs that actually go, uh, occurs throughout our facilities. We're working with our young people. When our young people actually come into care, one of the things we're always hoping for is that we keep them, you know, engaged with their families. We keep them engaged and in touch with the community. We're always hoping that we are able to provide guidance where our young people are able to go back out better from which they came out in the community forever how long we have them. And part of that is by and involving an array of programs such as some of our cure violence programs. So we have a partnership with Man Up. Uh, we also have a partnership with, you may have heard of SAVE, right? Stand Against Violence, East Harlem. So these are uh, violence interrupters that actually come in and work with our young people and able to help us work with our young people with, with regard to some of the carrying behavior that they may be bringing in from out in the community. Um, we also have trauma-informed care uh, that we provide services for our young people while in our care. But some of the programs that we have that our young people actually mm -hmm. like and really, really enjoy is we have a dog program, a kite program, which is a, a creative writing program, um, a father's love, which is a restorative justice program. We have physical fitness programs that come in and work with our young people. 
um, culinary programs, um, another program uh, called Audio Pictures, um, which is a music program for our young people. In addition to that, um, we have a partnership with Carnegie Hall as well. Um, so there's a lot of programs that we, 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 we provide for our young people to keep them engaged, to keep them active. Um, and, you know, occasionally, you know, young people come in and, and, and they're not even aware that these programs are actually in the community until they actually reach us in detention. Um, and with some of our programs, there's opportunities for kids that once they're back out in the community, they can continue on um, with the programs that we provide uh, for the young people uh, while they're in care. Um, so, I mean, and we also have educational programs. I definitely don't want to leave that out uh, with partnership with the Department of Education, um, as the commissioner mentioned uh, early on with re remote learning. Um, so we have volunteers that actually come in um, from the Youth for Christ uh, programs. So there's an array of programs. I may not be able to list them all at this moment. We also provide college courses for some of our youth um, through New York City community, community colleges. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, but the most important part about this is keeping our young people engaged, understanding that you know young people come from our communities. And as I said previously, we want them to go back out uh, better off than which they, from which they came. Um, and, and we work with families, you know, uh, programming with families. Um, and we're looking to improve that as well, um, uh, as, as often as possible. One of the other things we do, although it's not a program, is we work really, really hard. And I think it's important to highlight with regard to keeping our young people connected to the community. You know, our young people have access to phone lines. We enhance our phone system while in our care. So our can, young people can contact their families as often as possible as well. So it's always about keeping our kids fully, fully engaged. Um, if that answers the question that you're asking. It, it does, no, thank you. I mean, that was, um, that was a pretty comprehensive um, a view of it. Um, is, is, now, um, how do these programs inter, uh, work with the close to home programs as well? Is, is, is it the same, are the level of, is that level of access to programs the same in close to home as it is um, in, 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 um, in pre-adjudication? Um, so I think Sarah's trying to answer. Uh, she's muted. I think Aki, Acting Deputy Commissioner. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> can no answer. Um, yes. Uh, so we, we have a lot of part, the, the providers have a lot of partnerships with um, the same types of community programs um, in close to home as we do in detention. Um, we also partner with DYCD um, to bring in programs for both detention and close to home. Um, but the providers also, the, the close to home providers are, um, are, are also partnering with a lot of the same programs uh, that, we, that we partner with in detention. So yes, the, the, the level of participation and partnership um, is, is similar. The providers no. often, sorry, the providers often make their own connections. Um, outside of us, though, so so they also are reaching out um, to to the providers that are in the communities where the close to home facilities are. Um, so they might have different partnerships than we have, but but they are very similar to the ones that we have, if not the same. Um, can you list the close to home providers? You said that there are seven close to home providers. Yep, I can try to do this Sorry. off the top of my head. Or, or, <laughs> I'm just curious. I would, uh, you know, I want to make sure that. Um, to get a clear sense of, of, of who, who they are. Sure, um, so the close to home providers are Children's Village, uh, Good Shepherd Services, uh, Martin de Porras, Rising Ground. Um, sorry, I'm gonna, okay. hang on, let me think. Um, it's not a arms, quiz. Sheltering Arms, I know. Okay. <laughs> sheltering Arms, um, I, that's, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody the, the, that's off. Okay. So the reason that I asked is just to me. get a sense of making sure that, you know, there are organizations with the capacity to be able to make those connections, um, you know, those further connections to be able to have, and, and, and obviously those are organizations with long track records. Yeah. And, you know, St. Back. St. John's Instead. is the other one. So I just didn't okay. want to leave them off. <laughs> of course. Um, um, and, and how, and uh, I was going to have one more question around uh, uh, detention, and then I have one more question for, um, for Commissioner Hansel around budget. Um, how, what's the relationship um, with the Department of Probation then? Um, 
and um, and how closely are you in, uh, are are you and uh, Assistant Commissioner Watts working with your counterparts at probation to to kind of align uh, programming and align um, uh, you know the whole mission and and uh, striving towards outcomes. So, so let me start that off. So we have a very strong partnership with the Department of Probation. Um, and actually, you know, we, when young people, this, these are juvenile delinquents, um, when the police um, bring those young people to detention, um, we, have detention we have probation staff who are doing a risk assessment um, uh, evaluation or assessment of the youth at that time. So in order to determine whether they can be released um, into the community rather than being held in detention. Um, so we have that partnership with them so that that, that release can happen almost immediately um, when they are brought to us. Um, so we have very strong alignment with them on, on, um, on those kinds of things. We also um, have built upon the work that they have done this on the close to home side um, where they are using the risk assessment um, instrument called the, the Youth Level of Service or the YLS um, that the commissioner mentioned in his testimony, which, which focuses on um, a youth's criminogenic needs, risk and needs to identify the different programs and services that will address those needs. Um, so we have worked with them to continue the work that they are doing um, upfront on an assessment of the youth to determine what services the young person um, needs if they do come to us in close to home. Um, we also, um, just before I turn it over to, to Lewis to talk um, any, any more that he wants to say about the Department of Probation, um, but we also have uh, the Department of Probation and ACS, so Commissioner Bermudez and I um, co-chair the Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee, um, which is the, the stakeholders, we brought stakeholders together um, across the city to focus on different priorities uh, for the next year. Um, and so we are, we are working in partnership on, on determining what those priorities are and how we can implement, um, continue to implement juvenile justice um, change uh, throughout the city in the next year. So we work very closely with them. Yes, yes. I think, um, Sarah, I think you covered it. Thank you. Sure. Great, thank you. And I, I, I remember, I think my first time I attended a hearing probably 10 years ago about um, juvenile justice was with um, Deputy Commissioner Bushing and uh, Commissioner Schiraldi were, were, were testifying in front of us. Absolutely, so. Absolutely. Bushing, you're correct. <laughs> um, um, uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, just one, one question for Commissioner Hansel here. Um, uh, Commissioner, so you've been commissioner for, at ACS for four years now, or just about four years as we were just talking about yesterday. Um, uh, and, um, and I don't think I've ever seen you as, um, as riled up as I saw you talking about the state budget um, uh, and how they're shortchanging the system. Um, uh, can you speak a little bit about what are they even saying? What is the state saying? What is OCFS saying? Um, uh, when when we bring to them this equation where they are uh, millions, tens of millions of dollars or more um, shortchanging uh, New York City, and frankly, you know, with something like that property tax um, uh, cap, um, kind of seems like they're just kind of playing games with us, uh, budget games. Um, um, what? How, how, what are they even saying? Are they saying, sorry, you're just on your own, um, deal with it? Or are they saying, you know, are they, are they trying to pin it on us somehow? They do have a tendency of doing that where they kind of try to spin it around and then make it seem like we're not doing something right. Um, at least that's been my experience. Um, uh, can you speak a little bit more about what's, what are they even saying in response? Uh, well, it's a great question, um, and I, I apologize if I seem too riled up about it, but I do, I do get no, a little no, bit I can tell you're this. upset. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, you know, it's a, it's a perennial issue about how the state and the city should share financial responsibility for programs. It's something we go through every year. Obviously, we, um, we, we believe we provide high quality programming. We believe the state should support that, so we will always um, fight to protect the funding that we have. I think what is 
particularly concerning about what's happened in juvenile justice is, is it's not just about you know sort of incremental change. It's about a complete, the state's frankly complete abandonment of its financial responsibility for these programs. Uh, you know, I can't, I, I won't try to intuit what was in their minds in doing this. I will say though, you know, when, when um, the state um, basically eliminated all funding for close to home, uh, really about three years ago now, the, uh, the rationale that was given at the time was that when close to home was started, it was started as a pilot program. The, the program was reauthorized, reauthorized by the state legislature in 2018 at which point the, the governor said that it was no longer a pilot, it was now permanent, and it was now uh, New York City's responsibility to, uh, to carry the full financial burden of the program. Um, we actually scoured <laughs> the legislative record about what happened when the program was created in 2012. We couldn't find anything in there that said it was created as a pilot program. We couldn't find anything that said that the state's financial support was intended to be temporary. Um, so, you know, we felt that um, the city had agreed and, and had very much wanted to take over this responsibility from the state. We think we serve young people better and close to home than they had previously been served in the, in the state system. And the state agrees. The state just issued, uh, has issued reports on close to home and just issued also a report on, on Raise the Age about how successful these initiatives have been. So I don't think there's any disagreement between New York State and New York City that these programs have been successful in New York City. Um, and so it is really somewhat baffling that, that the state with regard to both close to home and raise the age has not just tinkered with you know, the distribution of funding, but has basically refused to provide any funding whatsoever to the city while uh, you know, fully funding or very, very substantially funding raise the age expenditures in the rest of the state. That feels to us like um, a real um, abandonment of responsibility for young people in New York City. And that's why uh, we think it's, it's something that's very important for us to continue to talk about. Very high percentage of state legislators are from New York City. Um, what are they saying? They have obviously a role in, in budgetary allocations. Or, or what are we hearing from our partners in the state legislature about this? Well, you know, obviously we've just begun to engage with them this year around the state budget. So I, I, I really can't speak to that. In the past, I think, you know, uh, these things kind of all in the end get worked out in a very uh, kind of omnibus negotiation between the governor and the two houses of the legislature. And for whatever reason, um, the, um, the reductions proposed by the governor have not been restored in the last few years. Um, very much hope that will be different this year. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, there's a, I mean, knock on wood, uh, there's a significant um, um, significant help hopefully coming coming in from, um, from the federal government. And so um, that provides state and local aid and, um, and, and hopefully there will be an opportunity then to have that conversation um, uh, right in time for the state budget. So, um, and that, that's certainly my hope. So, um, I will turn it over to my colleagues if they have questions. Um, feel free, anybody, to ask questions. Um, does anybody? Um, Councilmember Diaz. Good morning, and thank you for the extensive morning, and detailed presentation. There were two organizations that were mentioned, and I'm just curious to know, within the 37 councilmatic district, because where I serve, I'd like to know if you'd be able to give me some numbers, and if not now, then a follow-up. Um, like I know, uh, you, you mentioned um, training the youth to be influencers, interrupters, which is something that it's dear to me, especially being that in the 37 councilmatic district, we do not have such a team established at this time. My understanding is that Man Up is participating, which is just down the street, across the street, down the block from my district. We share East New York together. So I'd like to know more specifically, again, it doesn't have to be today, but sometime soon, as to what um, resources they're lending, what's the success rate, and just more, you know, getting to more and more about it and to know, again, like I said earlier, 
what impact does it have in the 37 council matter district itself? Uh, I'm looking to see the Bronzeville piece of, of my community where, where I see um, needs more attention that it has received in the past years. Well, Council Member, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for, for raising those issues. And um, we absolutely wanna make sure that we are um, providing services to, to young people, no matter what part of New York City they come from. Mm -hmm. um, so we would be delighted uh, to share that information. We don't have it at our fingertips today, but we'd be happy to. <laughs> and what I might suggest is, um, if you're willing, we'd love to sit down with you and your staff um, and talk to you about the service providers that we work with in your district. Okay. And we can also talk about the youth in your district and how we are serving them in the program. So we would be happy to uh, set up a time to do that and then uh, respond with any information or data that you need. Thank you. I have someone follow up. Good, thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanna mention one other thing, if I may. Um, so, so I appreciate that question too. I think it's really important that we provide services to, to the kids in the communities that need them, obviously. Um, but one thing with our services is that they are not necessarily located within a district or a, mm -hmm. um, a, a, an area. Um, a lot of our, our services, especially through uh, the Family Assessment Program and through JJI, which is our alternative to um, placement program, um, they go out to the communities where, where the kids live. So they may be, you know, it is, you know, Children's Village who, who runs the program and they have an office wherever their office is, but their, their therapists and their, their workers are going out and providing those services and the, and the, the therapeutic services wherever the kids are um, in their homes or in their communities. So, so we, we've been very intentional about thinking about how to get um, services out um, to, to communities, regardless of where, where the uh, provider's office actually is. Okay, but no, nonetheless, I, I like to see numbers. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I had a conversation with someone yesterday, a group was seeking funds, and they were happy to tell me in the last 10 years, they've served 112 individuals in my district. You know, in, in a district that's been lacking needs for over 10 years, that obviously was not a happy number for me. And as, as we know, COVID has impacted our youth tremendously. And someone who's worked for years, you know, with youth, it is dear to my heart. And coming in from the shelter population, I know the effects. So numbers really matter to me. You know, whether it's one child or it's a hundred. If there's families that need extra services, I, I want to know about it preventively, not reactively. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Councilor Diaz. Um, thank you. Thank you. Do, do any of uh, my other colleagues have have questions? Feel free to to ask them. I think we still have Council Members Gibson and Grudenchik, um with us right now. So, Barry or Vanessa, any questions? Okay. Um, okay. I, I'm gonna. Oh. Vanessa, do you have questions? Nope. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, I want to ask some questions related to COVID. Um, have we had any um, uh, COVID related deaths that have occurred in the juvenile detention facility, um, whether it be uh, youth in detention or, um, or staff? We have. Um... We have not had any youth um, who have uh, have died from COVID. Um, obviously, we're very happy about when we, you know, have, have taken um, you know measures to make sure that we we minimize any impact of the of the pandemic. Um, we have very tragically had four staff in our juvenile justice system uh, over the course of the pandemic who have passed away, um, and that's uh, you know that has continued to be um, a, a blow to all of us, a huge emotional blow. Um, to, to all of their colleagues and, uh, and obviously just, you know, redoubles our focus on making sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to keep everyone safe. Um, and are they, I'm sorry, you said in your testimony that they are um, deemed eligible right now for the vaccine? Um, only, the only youth, youth or staff, I'm sorry. Staff? staff. Yes, staff are all eligible. We, we actually, um, as soon as um, the vaccines were available, 
um, and the state began, you know, de determining which groups were going to be eligible in Category 1A and then Category 1B. Um, we began advocating actually in December um, for many of our ACS staff, but certainly all of our um, juvenile justice staff to be eligible. And um, we were, you know, we were actually very pleased that, you know, we, they were among the early groups uh, mm -hmm. that were made eligible back, I think January 11th, I think was the date they were added, added to Category 1B. So yes, all of our staff now in the juvenile justice system, both our ACS staff and our provider staff who work in the congregate facilities are eligible. And are they, is there a, um, are they kind of making appointments on their own or is there a coordination between ACS and health and hospitals to make sure that they're all getting the, the vaccine? Um, we're doing quite a bit around um, outreach and information to them, especially in the detention facilities, which uh, actually um, Sarah or, or Lewis uh, can describe or, or Dr. Mendoza. Um, you know, we want to make sure that, that they all understand uh, the benefits of the vaccine, can, you know, make judgments about benefit mm -hmm. and risk, um, and know how to access it. Um, we don't have uh, a dedicated system for um, connecting the vaccines. Um, we are exploring that. We're working actually with uh, the city's vaccine command center um, and others to see if we can provide additional resources specifically for ACS staff. Um, but at this point, we don't yet have that in place. Dr. Mendoza, can I ask, are you, are you, uh, how, how are you engaging with, with ACS staff around the necessity to get vaccinated? And are you out there saying, you know, giving them the vaccine figures and exhorting them to do that? <laughs> we're short of extorting. We're trying our best no, no, to do the anchors. Ex ex uh, exhorting, <laughs> exhorting, <laughs> exhorting, not exhorting. Exhorting, yes, we definitely are. Um, and we started again very, very early on, even before the vaccine was approved uh, for our, or even before our staff were made eligible for the vaccine, we had already started the campaign. Um, we have had at least now two town halls specifically for the Division of Youth and Family Justice. We have had already uh, several town halls before that, generally for the staff. We also have a mailbox that's available for all staff to write in any questions or any concerns they have uh, regarding the vaccine or even regarding COVID in general. We also have a, a weekly Ask Dr. Mendoza column where we highlight some of the new information that's coming down, or if we find that there's a pattern of concerns or questions that are coming in through the um, mailbox. We also have released at least three fact sheets now, um, go, um, ranging from just the basic information back in January to more detailed information about how the vaccines were developed and um, trying to also counter some of the myths or misinformation that people may have seen either um, through their communities or through the internet. Um, we also have a lot of videos now that we have gathered and we have, are planning to show that in loops, uh, video loops at the, um, uh, the facilities, the detention facilities as soon as we possibly can. And lastly, we have also gathered um, what we call our messengers, our credible messengers internally at ACS, at those who have already received their vaccines um, to then um, try to encourage others be, uh, based on their experience. We're putting together videos, we're putting together some of their um, own pictures and selfies. Oh, and by the way, before I forget, uh, because this is Black History Month, we are also addressing specifically the um, some of the concerns and uh, distrust that the African com American community has against these vaccines and with medicine in general. And we have a panel prepared next week um, to address this specifically. Um, in terms of coordination with, with, um, with the, the Vaccine Command Center, um, are, they, are they willing to like go like out there and I mean, in other words, like sometimes it's just having that access or if there's like on site, like you can, you know, on site vaccination so that they don't have to go through the rigmarole of going online and trying to track down appointments and all of that is, um, is that, a, is that something that's being discussed? Yes, it is. In fact, we are very close to potentially starting our own uh, vaccine uh, distribution center. Uh, we have uh, we have had several meetings already this week with the vaccine command center, and um, we have a, a site visit actually happening today. So it's it's going to happen. Okay. It's just a matter of when, and we're just also figuring out supplies and logistics and all of that. 
So in addition to the column, the Ask Dr. Mendoza column, you could be get vaccinated by Dr. Mendoza on site. <laughs> sure, if they want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how and do we have a percentage of staff that's been that's that's received the first dose? Are we no, tracking that? We 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 haven't been tracking that, and I don't know that we can actually ask them if they have been vaccinated. That might be okay. something that's legally we if, can't uh, do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just so that we're, I mean, I guess the, the, the reason I ask is just to kind of, you know, we've seen data now, kind of aggregate data that's showing, you know, a disparity among communities in, in, um, in the city where some communities have vaccination rates of, of close to, you know, over 10%, um, you know, I mean, City Island has a, has a vaccine rate of like, I don't know, I think it was like 16%, but, but, um, but, um, uh, uh, the trends that we're seeing are that are that um, wider communities and communities with with greater access to resources are are, are being are having higher percentage of vaccinations, um, and some communities uh, communities of color in the city or uh, zip codes rep, uh, representing communities of color are you know lower in the two percent to three percent, and so um, you know the, the concern is that that disparity starts to widen even further, and um, and so uh, you know that that remains a big concern. Right. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're specifically targeting um, the Black community, the African American community, next week with that um, with our panel, and um, a lot of also the fact sheets that we have put out were based on concerns. If there were specific patterns of concern we we saw for you know specific communities, so yeah, um, we are we are very much aware that there are these disparities. Um, and also to combat the disparities of the availability and accessibility of the vaccine. That's one of the reasons why we've been pushing the Vaccine Command Center to help us with our own on-site distribution center. Um, just a few more questions about some of the, uh, are, have, there been, have, have there been any youth in detention who have tested positive for COVID? Have we seen that at all? Um, yeah, yes. Um, so as the commissioner mentioned in, in his testimony, um, you know, we're doing everything that we can to try to minimize the spread of COVID um, in our facilities, um, understanding, you know, in congregate care settings that this can be a huge concern. So, um, you know, just to, to re reiterate some of the things that, that we are doing. Um, so all staff are screened and uh, before they end, all, any person who enters our detention facilities is, are screened and temperatures are taken. Um, we have distributed face masks to all staff. Um, the gloves are available to staff um, if they, they want those. We have hand sanitizer throughout the facilities. Um, we are encouraging hand washing and have signs posted throughout the facilities to, to encourage that. Um, with respect to the youth, um, as the commissioner mentioned in his testimony, the floating hospital, which is our medical provider, um, does daily temperature checks of all the youth. Um, we have distributed face masks or face coverings for, for all the young people as well. Um, and also encouraging hand washing and other, and other um, uh, hygiene um, techniques for them as well. Um, unfortunately, we have had a few uh, young people test positive um, since the beginning of the pandemic last March. Um, we have had um, 17 youth test positive for COVID. Um, but as of today, we have no youth who, who, are, um, who have, ha are in medical isolation because of, because of a positive test. And I think it's important to also add that we provide our staff with PPE gear. I mean, if there is a youth that are actually that have actually tested positive, um, all of our staff are required to be in full PPE gear, and there's also a proper disposable protocol of dispose with regard to disposing of the PPE PPE gear. Um, so all our staff are, are dip disposing of their gear inside of a red bin um, that's properly discarded. Um, we've heard some reports that youth uh, have not been provided an adequate supply of face masks and socks and underwear. Um, is how often are you provided PPE and socks and underwear? So all of our young people, upon entering the facility, they are provided with uh, socks and underwear. Um, the socks and underwear are, are washed, are, are cleaned two times per week, um, but they are provided with multiple pairs of socks and underwear. And as it begins, if there was socks and underwear, if there's a request for socks and underwear, 
we're providing our young people with uh, additional socks and underwear. You know, it's actually interesting that you 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 asked that question because that question came to us uh, from Legal Aid maybe a couple of months back. Um, and we were able to support and show them that, no, that's actually false. Um, that was a claim that was made by a young person, um, but it was a young person who had some mental health challenges at that time. But we're always providing our young people with socks and underwear, the clothing that they need, the footwear that they need, all the necessities we actually provide. Our kids don't actually want for anything while in our care. Um, and we provide everything that they need. So there's no need for them to have money. There's no need for them to have outside clothing. We give them everything that they need, including their commissary. And is that uh, just along those lines, we also heard that there was some um, issues around uh, lack of soap in the bathrooms. Is that, is, are we making sure that soap is replenished in the bathrooms at all times? Absolutely. We have an amazing housekeeping staff that ensures that the soap is replenished at all times, not only for youth, but staff as well. We're also promoting regularly that young people and staff are washing their hands as required. Often. Um, okay. Um, uh, certainly, the, the, you know, any type of like kind of qual quality assurance checks on that is, uh, is, is, I think would be would be appreciated. Um, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 there's families and advocates have reported that students in juvenile detention sometimes lose access to their DOE laptops as punishment uh, for what ACS determines to be misbehavior. Is that is there a policy around um, removing access to to uh, to the, the the laptops or um, or tablets that is, that DOE provides? No, absolutely not. Uh, uh, first and foremost, to be very honest with you, Chair. We promote education. I mean, that is very very big and high on our list. We have a, an amazing partnership with uh, uh, our part DOE partners with District Seventy Nine, um, and so every single day. Our young people are uh, provided with their Chromebook because they have designated Chromebooks that are issued to them. And they, daily, they actually receive new passwords, new passwords so that they can have access to those Chromebooks for security purposes. So you know, we will email the passwords to our supervisory team. Our supervisory team and school liaison would actually send out the password and give each youth, uh, provide each youth with their new password for the day. Um. Since Raise the Age has been implemented, um, has Department of Corrections been fully transitioned out of Horizon? Is there any DOC staff remaining? So, so um, as part of Raise the Age, um, DO, as the commissioner mentioned in his testimony, DOC and ACS um, ha had um, the authority to co-facilitate uh, the Horizon facility. Um, they, for the most part, DOC has transitioned out of Horizon. Um, however, they, they do um, still, they are still, there are still some DOC staff in, our, in the control room and monitoring the perimeter, but they do not have any um, interaction with staff at this time. Um, so that there no is- No interaction with, with youth in detention. Correct. Yeah. Um, have you seen a, are there any quantifiable, um, you know, uh, or qualitative uh, measures uh, to show the impact in that, um, in, in discontinuing uh, any relation between DOC staff and, and youth in detention? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, um, Chuck, I don't know if there's anything that you can think of in terms of measures that would quantify this. Yeah, I can't, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, yeah, I can't think of any specific measures. I mean, we had a really good working relationship with DOC at Horizon um, and we you know, cooperated and worked with the kids together simultaneously. So um, the transition there um, took place over many, many months and it was very slow and methodical and done purposefully. Um, so we weren't, you know, severely disrupting the kids. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think part of that lent to um, not having a significant, um, you know, dynamic change uh, within the environment and the kids. So um, I think part of that kind of slow transition really helped us with that. Um, there, mm -hmm. I'm sure that there are some 
measures that do exist, but none that really are striking with us. Um, overall, do you believe it's been a good thing that there's been that, that, that that's happened and that that's that that's been phased out? You know, it, it's my personal belief that um, kids should be um, kids should be treated as kids. And while we're certainly uh, DOC did a wonderful job um, working with us in those facilities, I believe that youth should be treated um, and supervised by youth care professionals. So hopefully that answers Ansel, the question. Uh, I think Commissioner Hansel has his hand up. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think uh, I just want to mention that actually under the under the state's raise the age regulations, um, DOC will continue to consult with us on security uh, and do security reviews. So even though um, at this point, uh, as Deputy Commissioner Hammeter said, they have a very limited presence just at Horizon uh, in uh, perimeter security and control room, no access to no contact with the youth. Um, and, and then that probably will, will also phase out over time. You know, we do want to certainly continue to benefit from their expertise in safety and security. And we will continue to do that through the relationship we'll have with them, which is actually something that the state regulations will require us to do, but we would want to do in any event. How many DOC staff remain on, uh, at Horizon? Actually, maybe, maybe 40, if that. I mean, when we started, there were 300 plus DOC officers you know, at Horizon, so maybe 40 of that. Gosh, there's 300 DOC staff for, for, how, for no. how many for how many youth in detention? It was like they outnumbered the youth in detention? Well, no, at that time, when it was raised the age, they were transitioning over from Rikers Island okay. with the youth that were coming from Rikers Island. So at that time, it was maybe 96 youth that was transferred over from Rikers Island at that time. So they right. brought their staff with the various tours that they have and monitoring their perim the perimeter as well. Um, and at that time, they had operational control of the facility. So from the 300 plus they had at that time, the few we have monitoring the perimeter now is maybe 40, if that. Yeah, I also just want to, you know, while 40 also sounds like a, a large number, um, those are different shifts as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have, you know, have to have the DOC staff there to cover all the different, you know, for 24-7 operations. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they are there. They are not all there at the same time. Yeah. Um, they are those there are three also. shifts a day? DOC has three shifts a day, Lewis? Maybe four shifts per day. They have uh, the three shifts, the AM, the PM, and the night, and I believe they have an overlapping shift. Okay. Well, right? But they have people that may go on vacation, um, uh, you know, with the pandemic going on, if someone is not well, their staff is out. Um, so, I mean, like, like Sarah said, you know, 40 may sound like a large number, but it's really, really small when you take into account the past days off, the various shifts. A um, few more questions on 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 uh, on close to home, um, and I, I realize this might be a difficult um, question to answer because of COVID, and and just uh, understand you know trying to anticipate what the uh, the future size of the program will be. Um, um, but but our, I mean obviously we've seen um, you know that the, the, the numbers have come down so much. Um, if, Strictly from a kind of a budgetary systems perspective, are we looking to phase out providers or phase out programs because of the because of that 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 kind of under you know, over over capacity that you know under capacity that we are at <laughs> under capacity in the system? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Well, let me, I'll start then, and then Terry. Um, so it's it's a good question. Um, obviously, you know we don't control the flow of young people coming into close to home. Um, but we do have a legal obligation to make sure that we can uh, take, take charge of any young person who is referred or is placed by a court. So we have to make sure we have adequate capacity to do that. And there are, as you, Chair, as you referenced, there are a lot of uncertainties. I mean, we are very happy that over recent years, we've seen the close to home census drop. Um, and we are very happy that it didn't go up during, because of raise the age. Um, and we're very happy that it has not increased, although we're not so necessarily happy about the reasons it hasn't increased during COVID because as we were talking earlier, part of that is because of uh, reduced court processing. Um, so there are so many variables and so many uncertainties um, that we have to be sure we have adequate capacity 
to uh, take custody of any young person that a court orders into juvenile justice placement. So we've got to basically, you know, staff and budget for um, some degree of uncertainty. However, that doesn't mean that we're not planning for the future. We are doing that. And actually, we are approaching the point where we will be um, recompeting the entire close to home program. Uh, and, and I'll let uh, Sarah speak to that in more detail. But um, as part of that, we really are looking at the program. We're looking at not just capacity, but you know, the whole structure of service delivery. Um, and starting later this year, we'll be initiating a process to consult with stakeholders about the future of the close to home program on, in, in all respects, including, uh, including size and capacity. And Sarah, you may wanna say more about that. Yeah, I think the only thing, I, you know, this is something that we are continually assessing um, and trying to, to strike that right balance between having enough beds and not having too many beds. Um, you know, with, with Raise the Age, there was some uncertainty with, with uh, respect to how many young people we would be seeing. Um, and so far that has not played out um, in, in the way that we thought it might. Um, so this is definitely something that, that we are, are looking at and trying to figure out. And as the commissioner mentioned, um, we, we are re-RFPing the whole close to home continuum and are in, uh, planning on issuing a concept paper um, in the fall of 2021 um, with new contracts starting uh, the RFP will go out sometime next year in 2022 and then new contracts in 2023. So this is something where we, we feel like we can right size the system, but also ensure that the services that the young people are getting within close to home uh, match the needs. Um, we are seeing a little bit of an older population, even you know, with Raise the Age, we haven't seen the numbers, but we the, the influx of young people, but we have seen an increase in the age of, of the young people who are coming to us. So we wanna make sure that we're not programming for a younger population and that we have the vocational and educational services that are necessary for an older population. So we are looking at, at, at not only the number of beds that we have, but the services and the programming that is necessary for the, for the young people who are coming to us. Um. And the, and the relationship, I, I didn't really ask that much about education, but the, the relationship with DOE and, um, and utilizing um, their, their resources. I, I'll just give an example. I was on a call yesterday with the Brooklyn Navy Yard talking about their STEM center, which is you know, available to um, you know, seven different high schools in the city. Um, that's really like a you know, kind of second to none um, or STEAM Center, excuse me, STEAM Center. Um, and, um, but it's, you know, the, the resources there are, are you, know, um, you know, pretty unparalleled in the system and they're looking at expanding that model um, uh, to other, you know, to, to other, and, it's, and it kind of works in a way that it's not its own dedicated school. It's, um, or it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, it, technically it's a district, but not a school, I think is the way that they said it. So, so it, um, uh, but but kind of our, our, what's the relationship with particularly around CTE that that the with DOE? Yeah, we have a very strong partnership with DOE in both detention and close to home. Um, you know, part of the reason that close to home happened, um, or one of the big reasons, was uh, the educational credits that that young people were receiving when they went upstate did not transfer when they came back to the city, um, and so really making sure that the young people who are placed with us are getting the credits that they are um, work, that we are working with the DOE to make sure that the transition from close to home back to the community happens seamlessly. Um, that also happens with detention. There are our DOE liaisons that are helping us connect the young people from the, the schools that they are attending either in detention or close to home back to their community schools. Um, so we have a very strong partnership with the DOE. Um, we have worked with them on um, um, sending kids to co-op tech um, and to the Judge K School um, so that, you know, where th there's like a vocational program along with educational services. Um, so we, we do have um, those kinds of connections with the DOE, but are always looking for more opportunities. Uh, for our young people and, and to connect with the educational and vocational services. Um, I think Lewis mentioned um, that, that we also have um, connections with the community colleges. 
Um, so because we are seeing that older population specifically in detention, um, we have connections with the community colleges who are providing college credit for kids, um, you know, and getting them prepared for that. And as that is the point I, I should have mentioned previously, um, when you asked me the education question, um, we also partner with CCA, Center for Community Alternatives, and they come into our facilities two times per week and they provide tutoring services for our young people um, to assist with education as well. Are those available also on um, through uh, through their tablets? Any are they having access to tutoring services, like not necessarily in person tutoring services, but remote tutoring services? No, this I mean this, this um after school help with the Department of Education through their tablets. Yes, oh, through the tablets. Okay. Yes, the CCA is in person. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, okay, I, I think that that's all of the questions that I have. Um. Um, at this time, do any of my colleagues have any additional questions they want to ask? I'll give a going once, going twice. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. I, think I want to thank you all very much. I appreciate um, um, the opportunity to, to, to sit down with you and, um, and, and review this um, um, all the programming and the, and the system that's in place. I am um, uh, obviously I'm, I'm kind of getting up to speed. This was, you know, this juvenile justice had, had been its own committee in the council for a number of years um, uh, during close to home and then uh, shifted into another committee for a little while. And then that committee got discontinued. Um, and so now it's, now it's here in general welfare. And so Obviously, we have a uh, you know a large portfolio. We had a large portfolio already, um, and so I want to make sure that um, issues around juvenile justice are not um, given short shrift in this committee. And so, um, um, you know, we I, I'm only chair for another you know, ten and a half months. Um, so I. I I certainly will be uh, looking to ask questions during our budget hearings in preliminary budget hearing in March and, and, um, and a, a executive budget hearing in May. Um, but I would like to, to have at least one more hearing with you all um, uh, before the end of the year to, um, uh, to go over perhaps um, uh, the concept paper on close to home or, or, or we could look at other, other issues if obviously we don't know what the we never know what the future holds as the last year has, has told us. So, um, but, but I would appreciate, uh, you know, maybe doing this one more, at least one more time as it's on dedicated hearing um, before the end of the year. Yeah, we um, would be, Chair, we'd be delighted to do that. And actually, you know, the whole purpose of our, the concept paper is to get the broadest possible input into yeah. the redesign system before we issue the RFP. So to the extent that a, a, a hearing with the council would be helpful in doing that, we would welcome it. That would be great, yeah, and especially because uh, you know once the RFP goes out, then we can't then we can't you know talk about it. So so having it at the concept paper st stage might make a lot of sense. Um, so I'll I'll make sure to to note that in my kind of ever expanding list of hearings that we want to try to get done before the end of the year. Um, so just notice to all committee uh, committee members that that we might be having you know two or maybe three hearings a month uh, as we get closer to December. So. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to have that hearing in person. That would be my, uh, you know, that would be my strong preference. That'd be nice. Um, that would be great. but, but, uh, thank you all very much. I appreciate the time. And if you can, um, uh, uh, have some staff remain on the call, um, to hear testimony from the public, um, that would be greatly appreciated. We'll certainly do that. Thank you very much, chair and, and colleagues. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you, commissioners. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Levin. We have now concluded ACS's testimony and we're going to turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will be calling up individuals in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you will begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue that you may begin. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few seconds delay when you are unmuted and before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Derek Robinson, 
Kate Rubin and Katherine Placencia. And that panel will be followed by Catherine D. Zengotita, Rochelle James, and Kay McKenna of Brooklyn Defender Services. I am going to now call up our first public panelist, Derek Robinson. Your time will begin now. Oh, can you see me? Can you hear me? All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Derek Robinson. I'm the Vice President of Grievances, Legal Services of the Social Service Employees Union, Local 371. On behalf of President Anthony Wells and our 22,000 members that we represent, we would like to thank the Chair, Council, Councilman Stephen uh, Levine, and the Committee on Juvenile Justice for the opportunity to give this testimony. SSEU Local 371 represents youth development specialists, caseworkers, program counselors, and institutional aides who staff and secure staff and secure and non-secure detentions, as well as ACS Ch Children's Center. I myself served as a tour commander for DYFJ ACS for 20, 23 years. We understand the spread of the virus required a still and still requires strong measures and difficult decisions. Those decisions, however, must be made with consideration for the welfare of all concerned persons on the basis of best information available and with full transparency. ACF ACS DYFJ failed to meet any of those standards at the onset of this pandemic. Our members who served the detained juveniles at Crossroads and Horizon Juvenile Centers have been and are among those most exposed to the risk of infection. We're told not to wear any personal protective equipment at the beginning of this pandemic. As a result, over 40, and I repeat, over 40 of our members, which included youth development specialists, caseworkers, institutional aides, program counselors, and also top management as well, tested positive for COVID-19. Caseworker Patricia George, a 25-year veteran of the agency, died from exposure to the virus in the course of work. Yet despite of her death, and several hospitalizations and unknown infections of residents and staff at Crossroads, the agency decided to shuffle residents and staff between Crossroads and Horizon instead of making all locations safe and then providing the necessary PPE and implementing obvious procedures to control the infection. ACS DYFJ has been unrealistic in believing that it can maintain detention centers with the necessary social distancing or even maintain discipline, discipline among the residents. SSEU Local 371 filed a state patch complaint for our members to finally receive all PPE, nef all PPE necessary and needed. The time has expired. Okay. You, you can continue, Mr. Robinson. Okay, needed for best performance of their tasks. For several weeks, we heard Platitudes about residents and staff being agencies top priority, but actions, not platitude, were needed. Our members had to endure multiple assaults by residents while trying to maintain social distancing and control of both facilities. At one point, NYPD had to enter Crossroads Juvenile Center and assist with maintaining control. As assaults continue, our members' only defense against violent residents is the agency's safe crisis management model that, that is ineffective against bigger and stronger residents and gang assaults. We are not blaming the agency for the pandemic, but for ignoring the science and not taking proper precautions. ACS DEYFJ made contact with, uh, with Local 371 to inform us of a 12 hour temporary sh shift change for the youth development specialist, opposed to original eight hour tour that they currently are on. This change, change would enable our members to spend more time at home during the pandemic. Local 371 bargained in good faith and agreed to the temporary change until knowledge was more available 
as the uh, COVID-19 crisis continued. Eight months after the change, the union demanded that youth development specialists return back to their original eight hours and the agency refused and we are currently in litigation with that matter. Thank you for the opportunity to give testimony. I would like to open up to all responses or any questions that you may have. Thank you. So Ms. Ron, can you, can you repeat, that, re, repeat that last uh, portion about the litigation on tours? Um, okay. Um, th there was a 12, uh, ACS came up with the idea to change the youth development specialist tour. They are currently work eight hour tours around the clock. They came up um, during the pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic, they changed it to 12 hour shifts. So now they work 12 hour shifts opposed to their normal uh, eight hour tour, 24 hours. So we so, so, so staff is working 12 hour shifts right now, currently? Correctly, I'm correct. 12 hour shifts, but um, it's, it's continuous overtime. So it's actually 16 hours. Okay. Um, uh, you know, obviously this is, um, your testimony paints a different picture than, than what we heard from the administration um, on, the, on this, the, um, the state of affairs within secure detention. Can, um, are, is, there an on, is there ongoing engagement um, um, outside of litigation, obviously, um, uh, between 371 and um, ACS management? So uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Watts, or uh, um, Deputy Commissioner Hameter? Yes, uh, currently we meet uh, once a month, once a month to go over issues. But during the pandemic, it was um, you know quite challenging between the union and the agency. They wanted to do things their way. We wanted to, you know, we was trying to uh, get advice and uh, it wasn't pretty much paying attention. So Commissioner Hansel got involved and, uh, and President Wells, I, our president on the return of his uh, um, illness from COVID brought it to a high level meeting and then they made the adjustments to make sure that the proper PPE was given, uh, 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 thorough cleaning and disinfecting the facilities began, began to happen. Um, and, but, but currently there's still issues that are in, that are being litigated. There's, there's at least, you said two, two different, um, lawsuits going on right now? No, no, actually what one lawsuit and it's uh, with the 12 hour shift. Okay. Because, um, oh, okay, good. I, I, the current status of PPE for your staff is adequate or, or inadequate still? Yes, it's, it's adequate at this point. Okay. Um, um, in terms of um, uh, your staff's ability to um, uh, enforce social distancing uh, among among detainees is that is that a, a youth in detention is that something that um, that your staff feels adequately um, enabled to do or or um, uh, uh, equipped to do yes at this point it is uh, unrealistic to try to do to implement uh, social distancing when we're dealing with troubled youth. Uh, we're dealing with a high rate of gang assaults going on inside the facilities. Um, you know, a lot of assaults on staff, assaults, youth on youth assaults. So it's, it's unrealistic to think that you can social distance residents, uh, you know, when, when you're doing your job at the, on, on these halls. Mm -hmm. um, are you, so, uh, is, is the union hearing um, from from its members, um, you know, any uh, issues around mental health crisis or kind of um, the, the additional stress that the pandemic has um, put on on um, staff? It's you know, there's it's it's hard for all of us, but it's especially hard for those that are um, continuing to have to work in in, in um, environments that would have been challenging prior to the pandemic are you how are you dealing with that uh, um well in, in terms of our members reaching out to us and with their issues and their complaints which are extremely valid and you know most of their complaints is uh it, it's hard to social distance it's hard to gain um 
you know, a high array of control in these facilities with, uh, you know, lackluster some of the tools that they have. Like, you know, they mentioned safe crisis management. That, that technique does not, and, you know, I repeat, does not help our staff in terms of um, intervening in situations, physical altercations. If the residents and, and these residents, because they're 16 and 17 now, so they're a lot bigger than most of our, the majority of our staff. So they, it is unrealistic for the SCM technique to try to take down a, a big kit. It's just unrealistic. And then once the once the restraint goes a little south, a little left, which it will, if the kid is much stronger than you, there's, then it turns into a, like a all out fight between a big strong kid and a, a smaller staff. And uh, our staff will, you know, are, are technically um, penalized <laughs> once the SEM goes south. Um, your staff in insecure detention, do you have a breakdown of, of um, male and female staff percentage wise? But, but Senate, no, I don't, I don't have that breakdown. But it's not exclusively male staff, is that right? No, not exclusive. There's a lot of uh, female staff as well. And a lot of female staff staff these uh, halls um, with with the with the males, and you know they work with the males also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, okay. Now, since I you know because this is this committee is now I mean I've obviously I've worked with um, with President Wells uh, for a number of years, mm -hmm. but um, uh, certainly and and pass along um, my regards to him. I didn't know that he he was he had was recovering from from COVID. Um, so please pass along my regards to him and and and. Um, wish him good health for me, but uh, please let him know that he can, he, you know, he can reach out to um, to this committee on issues around um, uh, juvenile justice now, um, and that my line is always open to him. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. I'll let him know. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Do Do any of my colleagues have any questions for Mr. Robinson? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, for your testimony. I look forward to working with you. All right, thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Mr. Robinson. I will now call on Kate Rubin to testify. Your time will begin now. Okay, thank you. Good morning or afternoon by a minute. My name is Kate Rubin. I'm the Director of Policy at Youth Represent. Thank you, Chair Levin, committee members and staff for holding the hearing and for the chance to testify. I also wanna say our hearts are with local 371 members and their families who've been sick or are recovering or who've passed away in the past year. Um, Youth Represent provides legal services for young people 24 and under who've been impacted by the criminal or juvenile justice system. We also advocate for changes in policy to stop criminalizing youth and invest instead in young people. And we're members of the Youth Justice Research Collaborative, which came together to study the implementation of Raise the Age in New York. And we're thankful for critical support the council offers for our legal work through the Innovative Criminal Justice Programs Initiative. Um, I go into this in a lot more detail in my written testimony, but I just wanna underscore that the impact of COVID would have been so much worse in the city if we'd had as many kids in the system as we did 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, youth arrest and detention declined for the entire past decade, culminating with sharp declines when Raise the Age passed in 2017 and then went into effect. And the experiment worked. Fewer kids arrested and held in court pens, fewer families dragging younger children and babies back and forth to court dates, fewer kids in secure detention facilities that, while certainly better than Rikers Island, still feel like jails in many ways, with DOC playing an ongoing role. Less of all of that, and crime stayed low. COVID-19 forced us to re-examine how many kids really needed to be in the system. And we appreciate that ACS recognized that and worked with the courts and agencies to reduce detention to historically low levels. And so in July and August of 2020, there were fewer than 50 admissions to detention citywide. Not only do we think this should be the new baseline, we think the numbers could be even lower. OCF's, OCFS data shows that a third of youth charged as juvenile delinquents and remanded to detention in 2020 were facing a top charge of a misdemeanor. And that is consistent with observations that we made in family court in the months prior to the COVID-19 lockdowns where we saw young people with open family court cases detained for school absence, for new arrest for low level charges, and even in a few cases for lack of stable housing. As you well know, 
every single community in New York City has been hit hard by COVID-19, but the same Black and Latinx communities that are overrepresented in the juvenile justice system have been the hardest hit by far. And that is why our call is to divest from carceral systems and invest in community supports, families, and young people. This is even more important as we face historic budget shortfalls and make difficult decisions about where to spend money. And the call is echoed in recommendations of public defenders and youth justice service providers, both of whom the Youth Justice Research Collaborative surveyed in the spring of 2020, and uh, which I've shared in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rubin. And I look forward to reading through um, the, full, the full written testimony. And, um, and again, I, I wanna extend my, um, um, my gratitude to the work that you're doing and um, my invitation to, uh, to work with us in this committee you know, moving forward over the next uh, 10 months ten while months. I'm here <laughs> to, to do the best we can yeah, on behalf thanks. of you in, in, in here. Appreciate that. Thank you, Kate. I'll now call on Catherine Placencia. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, members of the Committee on General Welfare for holding this important oversight hearing on the city's juvenile justice system during COVID-19. My name is Catherine Placencia, and I am a Tau Fellow with the Children's Defense Fund New York and a member of the Youth Justice Research Collaborative. The good news is that very few children are in the ACS detention and placement in New York City today. However, supporting those who are in custody and those in the community has proven to be very challenging during the COVID-19 crisis. Last month, we released a report that highlighted the impact of COVID-19 on the city's youth justice service providers and the young people they serve. The main concern expressed by the service providers was the disproportionate impact COVID-19 is having on communities of color, court-involved youth, and those in ACS detention and placement in New York City. Throughout our research, service providers report their concern about the lack of engagement and availability of needed mental health services for youth in the community, or even the electronics to be able to do so remotely. The same applies to education, where court-involved children in the community and ACS custody placements face challenges in engaging in remote learning or programming. How do we expect these children to thrive and stay out of trouble when many of their needs have gone unmet during this national crisis? Our research examining Raise the Age in New York City's courts is also important to share today. Based on the report we released this past summer, we know that Black and Latinx youth are disproportionately represented within the court system. Nearly all youth arrested in New York City were Black, 61% or Latinx, 32%, and the vast majority were male, 85%. Communities of color in New York City are still over-policed. Based on our court observ observers' perceptions of youth, people's race, ethnicity, 88% of the youth seen in family court and 95% of the youth seen in the youth parts were young people of color. This is despite the fact that Black and Latinx youth represent only 22% and 36% of the city's children, respectively. These extreme racial disparities need to inform the city's ongoing response to the COVID-19 pandemic in our youth justice system. Thank you. Thank you so much for your test. Thanks so much for your testimony. Thank you, Ms. Placencia. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Placencia. I'm now going to call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order of speaking. Catherine D. Zengotita, Rochelle James, and Kay McKenna. And we'll begin with Catherine D. Zengotita. Your time will begin. Hello, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Levin for holding this hearing and to all of you. Um, I'm apparently one of about a dozen people named Kate or Catherine testifying today. Um, my name is Kate Dezengatita and I am a senior trial attorney with the Juvenile Defense Unit at New York County Defender Services. Uh, my unit represents raise the age children in felony cases in both Supreme and family court. I have been a New York City public defender for about a decade. Um, I've chosen to testify on an issue that's something of a gear shift from what we've been discussing so far, 
but it is of the utmost important to our young clients in these unprecedented times. And that is the confiscation of cell phones by the NYPD. Um, the vast majority of court appearances in New York City are occurring virtually. If a child does not appear in court, a warrant can be issued for his or her arrest, and that's appear over the phone or video. Um, our clients are also often required to participate in programming as part of those cases, which is occurring virtually as well. Participation in these programs often determines, for example, whether a child will earn youthful offender treatment and avoid a lifelong felony record, or whether the child is permitted to remain in the community at all. In some cases, of course, a phone is a legitimate piece of arrest evidence. And in those cases, it makes sense that the NYPD and prosecutors would need it for a limited period of time. These scenarios represent a fraction of the cases we see where our clients lose their phone to the police, often permanently. Phones are held endlessly as, quote, arrest evidence when they have no discernible connection to the criminal case whatsoever. My clients and my colleagues and I spend hours on the phone trying to figure out where our clients' phones are and how we can get them back. It is a wild goose chase and we almost always come up empty handed. Without a phone, young people cannot log into their court appearances. They also cannot, for example, call their attorneys, their probation officers, the programs they are mandated to attend virtually, the remote therapy sessions they are required to complete or conduct their court ordered curfew checks. If parents stay home from work so that their child can use their phone, which they often do, they lose money to support their family and sometimes even put their jobs at risk. Moreover, the vast majority of young people in the system come from low income families. Often the phone that was confiscated was the only phone the family had and therefore the entire family is left disconnected. Just recently, a 16 year old client of mine was arrested in his home and every electronic device in the house was confiscated. And now multiple siblings have no way of logging into remote school. Combined with the DOE's abysmal provision of functional laptops or tablets to his students, this family has now been floundering for months. For another client, 14 years old, whose case has been pending for almost a year with literally no action on the prosecution's part to move it forward at all, and where there is no apparent relationship between his phone and the case against him, this confiscation has been a maddening financial hardship. His mother is in a binding service contract for this phone, and she continues to pay it each month despite not having the phone itself. She has had to do this through a house fire that destroyed everything she owned, through a hospitalization for COVID that kept her from work, and with no end in sight or answers about when they will get the phone back. In a time when a phone represents a young person's entire ability to engage with family, school, work, and most relevant here, court appearances and obligations, and when cases are dragging on for many months longer than usual, these confiscations are completely unjust and unacceptable I am asking the city council to take up this important issue, investigate it and tackle it immediately. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm happy to, to work with you uh, further on that. It's obviously it's, it's um, uh, beyond just the scope of the, the agencies that are um, here testifying today, but it, it involves NYPD, but we should be, I'm happy to work with you on this as a, um, as, a, as an issue, a matter related to juvenile justice. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Kate. And I apologize for getting your name incorrectly. No, you did great. It's oh, better than most people do. Thank you. <laughs> I'm now gonna call on Rochelle James as our next, next panelist. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, my name is Rochelle James. I'm a fellow with the Special Litigation and Law Reform Unit at the Legal, Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. We're the primary provider of legal representation for children charged with juvenile delinquents, juvenile offenders, and, and adolescent offenders in the city of New York. We thank Tier 11 for holding today's hearing and for giving us an opportunity to share our testimony. I will not read our full testimony, but encourages the council to read it. While the city and ACS have made substantial efforts to get children in detention and placement home to their families and to increase safety of those who remain in these facilities, the dangers of COVID-19 remain very real and more must be done. First, the city must ensure that detention and placement staff abide by the rules requiring proper use of PPE in these facilities. 
our staff have witnessed facility staff appear on video conference with our clients without wearing a mask properly or at all. We have also received reports of failures in observing social distancing and other protocols put into place to keep both staff and youth safe. Thankfully, we now have vaccines for COVID-19, one of which can be administered to anyone 16 years of age or older. Youth in detention and placement to Youth intention and placement should be prioritized. Depriving youth who are, are at higher risk of infection due to being held in congregate detention and placement facilities, as well as due to high rates of comorbidities, the opportunity to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, even though they have been deemed eligible by NYS Department of Health, flies in the face of the equity and fairness principles that the city espouses. City Council and ACS should push OCFS to amend its guidance to include youth in detention and other congregate settings that have been permitted by DOH to receive vaccines in phase 1B. Second, we share the same concerns regarding confiscation of youth cell phones discussed in Kate's testimony and have addressed it in our own written testimony. Third, we have been actively working with the Department of Education and ACS to address obstacles to engagement in remote learning in detention and placement. As a result, we successfully advocated for funding for tutors to come in person in afternoons and assist students. This program is key. We ask that the council ensure that this program continues to be funded at least until vaccines again allow for in-person teaching. Finally, COVID-19 delays have also created significant delays in filing petitions in family court. Crucially, the delay in filing petitions delays the assignment of counsel, our ability to meaningfully investigate a case and to ensure the preservation of key evidence like witness testimony and security camera footage. Time is truly of the essence for our clients. There's also a lesson from this time. With continued family court adjourn adjournments, youth have had to wait months before coming before the court. Of the youth whose cases have been delayed, many have had no further contact with law enforcement despite this extended period of time. This demonstrates that more youth may be able to benefit from adjustment than previously thought. As a result, the city should reevaluate re the process for deciding which cases are approved for adjustment to ensure that the juvenile legal system is not overreacting to normal adolescent behavior and criminalizing behavior of youth of color who suffer from over-policing. Thank you again for holding this hearing on these critical issues. Thank you so much. For, thank you very much for your testimony. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. I'm going to call up our next panels. Before I do, I do want to remind that the following panel will be Julia Davis and Charlotte Pope. And now I'm going to call on Kay McKenna of Brooklyn Defender Services. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ilana Rothman, not Kathleen McKenna. And as a super supervising attorney in the Adolescent Unit at Brooklyn Defender Services, I want to thank the Committee on General Welfare for holding this important discussion on the juvenile justice system during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we near the one year anniversary of the closure of family court, we are reminded of what Martin Luther King Jr. said, justice too long delayed is justice denied. And when we are talking about juveniles, our clients who are children, the judiciary and social scientists understand that the express purpose of the Family Court Act must be to assure swift and certain adjudication at all phases of the delinquency proceeding. Black and brown communities have been hit hardest by the current global pandemic. And because of racist systems and policies, studies show that it is youth from those same communities who are further traumatized by contact with the juvenile justice system. While the Department of Probation is adjusting many cases, and Corporation Council is attempting to divert more cases than ever, as those are the two organizations responsible for the virgin decisions, which ACS is not. And Corporation Council is actively seeking to resolve already filed cases. There are still hundreds of black and brown children without any movement towards resolution of their situation and no opportunity for due process. With no movement towards any resolution, presentation of innocence or finding of guilt, Youth and their families are left unsure about what the future holds reg with regards to their arrest at a time with already unprecedented uncertainty. The delay in filing and resolution of cases means that youth are not getting the services they might need in any proximate and effective manner in relation to the incident, including the possibility of being removed from their home, undermining the very intent of the Family Court Act. 
We thank the City Council for holding this important hearing today and shining a light on the impact COVID-19 has had for young people with court involvement. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rothman, thank you. Thank you, Alana, and again, and I apologize for getting your name wrong entirely. It is no worries at all. <laughs> I'm now going to call up our next panel. Our next panel will be Julia Davis, followed by Charlotte Pope, and we will begin with Julia Davis. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Levin and members of the committee. I'm Julia Davis. I'm the Director of Youth Justice and Child Welfare at the Children's Defense Fund in New York, and we do work on policy related to children who have contact with the criminal justice system. I wanted to uh, ask you to take a look at the submission we made, which includes a lot of research that's come out of the Youth Justice Research Collaborative. We did surveys of the defense bar and community service providers who are working with kids during COVID. I wanna highlight a few things today that I think are important as you think about the way that this committee is going to engage with these issues over the next 10 months. One is I wanna encourage you to really think about uh, what uh, committee member Diaz said, which is that at the, the Black and Latinx communities in New York have been very, very hard hit by COVID. When we look at the deaths of parents and guardians from COVID in New York State, 50% of them, actually 57% happened here in New York City. So we're really in an incredibly perilous time for young people and families. And that does two things in the juvenile justice system. One is it increases the likelihood that young people will be in crisis and come into the system. It also makes it incredibly difficult to serve those kids, both in the community and in facilities. And we've heard a lot about that today. I think there's some things that the committee should really focus on as it thinks about the scope of its youth justice work going forward. One, thinking about how alternatives in the community, including more types of supportive housing can work to keep more kids out of detention. Kate Rubin mentioned uh, that many, many young people in detention today are in on misdemeanor charges and have very low levels of risk associated with them based on probation analysis. We know more people can be home, more young people can be home, but we can do that only if we have more spaces for them and more supports for them in the community. And that's what we found in our survey, talking with defenders and talking with community-based providers. It's also important that young people have money now. Economic supports in the, you know, as grants, as stipends, as emergency funds to buy phones, to buy computers, to pay for bills right now is critical. And the more we can make those types of small investments, the more we're gonna keep young people out of this system and get them home sooner. We also need to restore in-person services for all young people as soon as possible in every building, in every community. And so that means prioritizing that workforce for vaccination and for any types of supports they need to connect with our young people. If we don't do that, we will see young people coming into this system more and more and more and staying for longer periods of time. The last thing I wanna say is we need to be investing in community-based organizations like Exalt and others that are doing this work. They need more money, resources, flexibility to do this. The work is harder. The young people are facing much more difficult challenges. They need to have have um, a lot of flexibility and, and, and time has expired. in order to move forward. You can so continue, wanted, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I think you know, the last piece I'd love to have this committee think about is how do we center young people at risk of contact with the system and those who have had contact with the system as the city develops employment strategies post COVID. When we're thinking about how the city recovers, how do we prioritize this group of kids? They lost out on SYEP, they're losing out on opportunities to connect with service providers for employment and financial supports. Could this committee really prioritize this group of young people for creative work going forward as the city thinks about economic recovery? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to do that in, in partnership. And so I, I, you know, I, I wanna extend an invitation um, to start thinking about that now. Um, you know, as we approach the budget season so that we're making sure that those opportunities are, are, are there in the budget and, and fully funded. Just give a thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And now I'll call on Charlotte Pope as our next panelist. 
The time will begin now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levin and members and staff of the committee. My name is Charlotte Pope and I'm testifying on behalf of Girls for Gender Equity. Every weekday, OCFS posts daily detention bed capacity. And so for the past 46 weeks, GGE has been tracking the changing population of youth incarcerated at Crossroads and Horizon. And according to our tracking, the population of young people has jumped from 60s in April 2020 to over 110 reported yesterday, a jump of 70% since we started tracking during the pandemic. Uh, because it came up earlier, but I didn't hear it fully answered, I just want to read aloud that comparing the first four months of this fiscal year to fiscal year 2020, there was a 65% increase in length of stay in detention from 23 to 38 days. Aside from the council convening these oversight hearings, there's limited public transparency on conditions of confinement, and we'd call on the council to legislate public reporting similar to introduction 1954 passed last June that requires DOC and correctional health services to issue reports during public health emergencies. The most recently reported average daily cost per youth per day in detention is now over $2,000. We'll note that's up 25% from $1,600 in the prior year. At that price, we estimate that the total cost of incarcerating girls in detention during the pandemic has reached nearly $2 million. That's with an average daily population of around two incarcerated girls per day. On schooling, the DOE is experiencing tremendous resource and staffing challenges due to the blended learning model underway citywide, and we encourage the council to again advocate that the city pursue decarceration as a solution to issues of compromised access to education. Alarmingly also, the new mayor's management report discloses that ACS is working closely with the Department of Investigation to conduct canine searches in detention and quote, continues to work towards building its own internal capacity in this area. GGE is staunchly opposed to growing de detention operations in this way. And because we didn't hear it come up during today's hearing, we would appreciate council's oversight here as well. I'll say that we've also submitted detailed written testimony. And so we thank the council for this oversight again and attention to these issues. And thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, thank you, Ms. Pope. I, I, um, I wasn't aware of that last point that you made. And so I could follow up with, um, with ACS around that. Um, uh, and and I just want to thank GGE. We um, my office had has been had been engaging with with uh, GGE around um, uh, moving towards um, moving towards a, a, a circumstance in which we have no girls in juvenile detention in the city of New York. Um, um, Elizabeth Adams, my legislative director, had been working with with, with you guys prior to us taking over. Uh, juvenile justice portfolio. So, so I would like to continue doing that, and and obviously greatly appreciate all the all the partnership with GGE, um, and, and that that you all have had with with my office over the years, and, and look forward to continuing that. Thank you. Thank you again, Charlotte, and thank you, Chair Levin. At this point, we have heard from everyone who has signed up to testify, and we appreciate your time and presence. If we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please at this point use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order of hand raised. Okay, seeing no one else, I'd like to note that written testimony which will be reviewed in full by committee staff may be submitted for the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing. And you can do that by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Levin, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you, Council Kilowan. Um, and thank you to everybody that, that testified today. And um, I just wanna commit to you all now that um, because this was a, you know, our first hearing um, uh, on the subject matter of juvenile justice in the General Welfare Committee, this was a first step, um, and uh, and I, I feel that I learned a lot, and I think uh, uh, committee members and committee staff learned a lot as well today. Um, but this is not, um, you know, this isn't just a pro forma thing or something, you know, where we're going to be checking a box. We we want to make sure that we're delving into 
the issues that were raised in public testimony today um, and, um, and moving forward. So we have an opportunity to have follow up during the preliminary budget hearing next month, um, the executive budget hearing in May, and, um, and then at least one other uh, opportunity for an oversight hearing um, uh, in the fall. So um, um, I commit to you all that I, I will be available at any time um, to address matters that you raised um, as members of the public and, and, and providers um, and staff um, during this hearing. And I look forward to, to doing that over the next 10 months and 11 days um, while I'm still in office. So um, thank you all so much for your time today. I want to thank our sergeants at arms and staff at the council um, who um, have uh, you know, worked uh, really diligently um, these months in, in conducting all of, all of our hearings. Uh, so I greatly appreciate all the, all the work that you all have done in making these hearings go smoothly. Um, and, um, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.